With 730 miles of trails, there are many great hikes in Glacier. Stating which are the best, well, that's rather subjective. Some hikes are just too hard or even scary for a lot of people. And weather can make a hike incredibly cool or rather miserable. So I've chosen three hikes with varying degrees of difficulty, which are each shot on beautifully sunny days. And I've thrown in a bonus one, just to show you how changing weather can really make a trail unforgettable. I'll start with an easy one. One of the challenges of hiking in Glacier National Park is adjusting to the altitude. Lake McDonald on the west side of the park is a little more than 3,100 feet above sea level. The floor of the Many Glacier area on the east side of the park is over 4,900 feet above sea level. Many of the trails and mountain passes reach between 6,600 feet and 7,200 feet. That may not seem too high for those used to Colorado, but flatlanders will have to get used to the altitude. Hiking a trail with lots of elevation gain on the first day in the mountains is not a good idea. To help your body adjust, spend your first day exploring the Sun Road or hiking a flat trail. One of the best flat hikes in the park is the Bullhead Lake Trail. It's in the Mini Glacier area. The trailhead is located near the Swift Current Motor Inn parking lot. The trail begins in trees. One is rather unique. After about five minutes, a spur trail leads to Fisher Cap Lake. Moose live in this area and they feed in the lake nearly every day. Some say that most of the images of moose you've seen in nature calendars were taken at this lake. They feed on plants that grow in shallow water. The females tend to feed in groups for up to hours at a time, providing plenty of time for photographers to get a nice shot. They train their young to hide in the nearby brush. Moose move methodically in the water, but they can move quickly when they want to. Moose are the largest members of the deer family. This is clearly apparent when they get on shore. They are accustomed to people, but they are still wild, and you shouldn't get too close. Bulls tend to feed by themselves. The best time to see them is late afternoon to early evening. Bears tend to come down here around dusk, so it would be a good idea to be off the trail by then. Deer also feed here, in the nearby woods and near the shore. A few minutes further down the main trail, there's an interesting green rock formation. In places, berries grow along the trail. They are a favorite food of bears. So where there are berries, there eventually will be bears to eat them. Talking, singing, or making any noise that sounds human is a good idea when walking in bear country. About a mile and a half from the trailhead, you're at the eastern end of Red Rock Lake. It's another third of a mile to Red Rock Falls. From time to time, the trail heads through trees. If you're alert, you may be lucky enough to see a moose. It's hard to believe that such a large animal can be so difficult to see. The trail goes through dense growth and even moose get tired of bushwhacking through it. So occasionally, they take the trail. Give them the right of way. Just before the falls, the geology gets bizarre again. Just imagine the forces involved to bend this rock formation. And you may remember earlier that the rock was green. Well, here it's red. Rangers frequently walk the trail, looking for signs of bears. Anything out there of any interest? Well, fleeting sight sighting of a grizzly. This ranger was warning hikers that a grizzly was using the trail to get over the mountains via Swift Current Pass. Red Rock Falls is at the 1.8 mile point. This is a favorite spot for families. There are plenty of rocks for kids to climb on. So far, the trail has gained only about 100 feet. It's another spectacular mile and a half to Bullhead Lake. The trail gains about 300 feet as it follows Swift Current Creek. The lake appears to be two lakes, but it's really one that's connected by a narrow channel. 
This is the first pool. If you look back, you can see the Mini Glacier Hotel. Those are moose tracks in the water. The larger Bullhead Lake pool is about three and a half miles from the trailhead. It's one of the most tranquil places in the park. Here you're surrounded by mountains on three sides. And at Valley's End, there are 3,000 foot waterfalls. There's another oddly shaped rock formation where mountain goats sometimes feed. And the lake is clear and blue. Primitive life can also be seen on this trail. The yellow and green blotches on these rocks are alive. They're lichen. Lichen grows very slowly. These blotches are likely to be hundreds of years old. For most, Bullhead Lake is the turnaround point. But the trail continues. 2,000 feet up and three and a half miles from here is Swift Current Pass. And beyond that, Granite Park Chalet. The view from Swift Current Pass, it's my favorite in the park. When in the mountains, it's only natural that you want to climb them. But this trail is proof that short flat hikes can be just as memorable as a long steep one. In this segment, we'll cover the 15.2 miles of the very popular, and with good reason, Highline Trail. The trailhead is at Logan Pass. We'll start by traversing the garden wall. Three and a half miles later, we'll climb the formation called the Haystack. At the halfway point, we'll get refreshed at Granite Park Chalet. Then we'll cross the Continental Divide and take in the view that makes this hike special. Then we'll hike down 2,300 feet past several lakes to the journey's end at the Swift Current Motor Inn. The trailhead is across the Sun Road from the Logan Pass parking lot. A signpost reminds us that more than 15 miles will be hiked before dinner tonight. This is bear country. There are more than 500 grizzlies in the park. And as the sign says, there is no guarantee of your safety. With an incredible view of the valley below, the trail drops quickly 200 feet to a shelf blasted into the several thousand foot high garden wall. It's so narrow that you have to stop to let other hikers by. It may seem scary, but it's not. In part because there's a handy garden hose covered safety cable to cling to. The trail is hundreds of feet above the Sun Road at this point, so you can still hear the traffic as it winds its way down the valley. It's not until you get off the shelf and look back that you see just how massive the cliff face is. But it's the view across the valley where you will most likely cast your gaze. Soon, you're off the cliff face and the trail opens up a bit. Bears aren't the only wildlife feeding here. Bighorn sheep like it too. Across the valley, the 492-foot Bird Women Falls comes into view. The trail cuts across the safety of a scree field. Then you're back in the trees where bear precautions are necessary. Some wear bells on their boots, but most rangers think they're not loud enough. Talking, singing, or generally making noise is deemed the best way to let a bear know that you're coming. Some of the smaller creatures of the park may come out in hopes that you'll toss them a crumb or two, but don't. It's best to keep wild animals wild. The trail continues along the garden wall, and by now you can no longer hear the road below. It's only natural to spend most of your time looking down the trail. But the view up is also impressive. This is a place where you can truly be surrounded by the magnificence of Mother Nature. It's easy to understand why the big mountain in the distance is called Heaven's Peak. At this point, we're only about an hour from Logan Pass, and you can see some amazing scenery without too much effort, and you can turn around whenever you want. Again, you never know what you're gonna see on the Highline Trail. Here, a mountain goat family grazes next to the trail. Now, these goats may seem cute and docile, and most of the time they are, but they, like all wild animals, are unpredictable, and it's best to keep your distance. The trail is pretty flat for the next mile and a half. The view is anything but. 
There are few trees or fellow hikers this far out. And now it's just you and the mountains. At about the three-mile point, there's another grove of trees, beyond which there's another shelf carved into another cliff face. If you don't have the time to do the whole trail, this is a great place to stop and take in the scenery before heading back. Notches in the cliff make excellent picnic spots. They're a great place to take in the McDonald Valley while resting up for the several hundred foot climb up the haystack. This is also a great place to interact with other trail users. Most are friendly, but some will insist that you get out of their way. It seems here even wildlife enjoy the incredible panorama. When you see hikers heading the opposite way, it's a good idea to ask them if they've seen anything up ahead. Any uh, sheep or anything over there? There are three nice big rams right up here on the trail. The cliff face is only a couple hundred yards long. Then there is a clearing. In this case, bighorn were grazing in the clearing. Bighorn sheep are the symbol of the park, and it's a treat to see just one. And you're really lucky when you see several doing what bighorn do. The open space and lush grass attracts other grazers as well. Here, predators such as bears can be seen with plenty of time to get out of the way. However, some grazers think it's safer on the rocky ledges. Well, usually they're right. But seconds before this video was shot, this bear was chasing a goat. The goat got away. Bears are omnivores. That means they'll eat just about anything. They also can be territorial. This mama bear has a cub, and when she finds an area with plenty of her favorite food, berries, she'll defend the area for her family. These bears are about a thousand feet above the trail, but these animals can run at 35 miles an hour. And when you see a grizzly heading your way at, and you're 90 minutes away from the nearest road and a few hours away from any medical help, you're glad that you're not the slowest person on the trail. Luckily, this bear was just checking us out. Right about here, the crew had a little problem. This was the last shot we got with the HD camera, but we were prepared, at least a little bit. The rest of the hike was shot with our standard definition backup camera. The climb to the haystack is about 250 feet over two switchbacks. About 10 minutes later, we are at the top. That's Heaven's Peak in the distance and McDonald Creek to the left. Here, there's evidence of an old forest fire. In the distance, you can see a large burn area from 2003 when dry conditions and lightning strikes caused fires that burned much of the park. After rounding a bend at the six mile point, Granite Park is visible. It's a welcome sight because you can purchase something to drink and even a snack to augment your personal supply. Before you get to the lodge, there's a spur trail to the Grinnell Glacier Overlook. If you decide to take the trail, it will add about 1.2 miles to the hike and another 1,000 feet of up and down. This is the view from the overlook. You are standing exactly on the Continental Divide. It's a lot of work to get up here, but the view is spectacular. The chalet is the halfway point. It's about seven and a half miles from Logan Pass. It's a good place to rest and to meet fellow hikers. More importantly, you can buy water and food here. This is also one place where you might actually get cell phone coverage. Oddly, the shop contains a fridge, but there is no electricity. Also oddly, the prices are reasonable but there's no trash collection here, so you have to pack out whatever you purchased. The chalet also provides primitive accommodations. You have to supply your own bedding and provide and cook your own meals. The trail to the pass leads past the bunkhouse. Several trails meet here, and a signpost will point you in the right direction. There's a 500-foot climb to Swift Current Pass, and you may be sharing the trail with a few bighorn sheep. After eight miles and this latest climb to 7,200 feet, you may get a little tired, but it's all downhill from here. But going downhill, as we said, is actually harder on the body than going uphill, as I was soon reminded. Ah! I was very close, hurt my right knee. Perhaps due to being tired or my painful knee, well, I was in need of a boost. And I got one, tiredly, I'll explain. Well, that's what I came to see. This view. 
and I was tired. Didn't expect that last bit of up, 500 feet or so of up. But the view is beginning to be there, and uh, I can't wait to get a little further down the road. Feeling better, heart rate's getting back down to 125. Nice cool breeze in my back. Sunny, it's a good day. After nine miles, I'm approaching the view I've come to see. It's amazing. I'm at over 7,000 feet, looking 2,000 feet down a valley carved by a glacier 12,000 years ago, leaving behind a chain of beautiful lakes. In addition, I can faintly hear the sound of 3,000 foot waterfalls. This is a special place. There's no other way to see this. You have to hike here. You'll have to endure exhaustion, blisters, and pain. While hauling yourself, your food and water, and your cameras for eight hours just to see this. They say that you appreciate things more when you earn them, and they're right. After crossing yet another shelf, you're close to the falls. If anything, the view only gets better. The falls begin at a hidden melting glacier. This trickle will soon join others to form the Swift Current River. Several wide-eyed minutes later, I'm on the valley floor. I look back and realize that this meltwater is just starting a journey that will end in the Arctic Ocean. In 10 to 20 years, the glacier will be gone, and this stream bed will be dry for much of the summer, causing local wildlife to look elsewhere for this vital fluid that we all take too much for granted. Almost daily, bears use this trail to cross the divide, so you need to be alert. That was dried bear scat. Temporary suspension bridges help you cross a couple of creeks. At this point, I'm not stopping as often to look at the scenery, but I made an exception at Red Rock Falls. It's just a short walk off the main trail. It also means I'm only 1.8 miles from the end of the trail. This is the last large lake on the trail, and while it would be nice to stay and appreciate it, I do so only briefly. It's been a long day, and I'm much more interested in basking in the luxury of a sparse, TV-less room with my boots off. Several minutes later, eight hours after starting out and carrying a lifetime of memories with me, that's what I did. The trailhead is located down the road from the Mini Glacier Hotel. But if you want to shorten the hike by about three miles, take the boat. Even then, the hike is a strenuous one. In about four miles, you'll climb from 4,900 feet to 6,600 feet above sea level. Tickets for the boat ride and ranger-led hike sell out quickly, so it's a good idea to purchase your tickets a day or so in advance. The boat leaves from the dock behind the Mini Glacier Hotel. During the lake crossing, a ranger describes the scenery. Then there's a five minute walk to Lake Josephine, where another boat awaits. Those who start from the trailhead emerge from the trees near Lake Josephine's boat dock. They then follow the trail along the northern shore. The weather can change rapidly near the Continental Divide, and on this September morning, frost covered the gangway. After the hike when the boat picked us up, the temperature was near 70. 
Ranger hikes begin with a talk about safety. This is bear country, and bears have the right of way. We learn the best way to avoid a bear encounter is to make noise. When a bear hears a human voice, it will likely get out of the way. But if you surprise a bear, it's likely to be unhappy, and you may have to use your bear spray to fend them off. The trail heads into the woods on a boardwalk over marshy ground. Just a few hundred yards from the boat landing, the climb begins. The trail gains a few hundred feet in the first 30 minutes, and on most days, the wind grows stronger. Soon, your efforts pay off with amazing views of Mount Gould, which dominates the head of the valley. On ranger-led hikes, you'll have plenty of time to rest, as you'll learn about local geology, wildlife, or any subject in which the ranger is fluent. This ranger is into geology. She tells us sediments which make up the rock of this trail are very old. The layers were laid down hundreds of millions of years even before dinosaurs existed. Right next to the trail, there's evidence of the powerful forces which bent the rock and formed these mountains. Recently, rangers have had to explain one more thing, why so many trees in the area are dying. The answer is an infestation of a boring beetle in a budworm that feasts on new growth. The climb continues, and depending on the season, the foliage gets more colorful. Hundreds of millions of years ago, this entire area was under an ocean. This is fossilized seafloor. You can still see the ripples. It's now about 6,000 feet above sea level. There's a gentle rise over the next mile and a half, bringing Salamander Glacier into view, which is just above our destination. The saddle is reachable from the other side of the mountains via the High Line Trail. There are fewer trees the higher up you go, and the views of beautiful lower Grinnell Lake get better and better. The lake gets its vibrant turquoise color from small rock particles that were scraped off by the glacier. There are other trails in the area. A trail on the opposite side of the valley leads to Pygin Pass. Bears aren't the only mammals on the trail. This little guy will attempt to get your food, but don't let him. In this section, Lower Grinnell Lake is a constant welcome companion. The scale of the scenery is hard to capture in a camera. Somewhere on that rock face is the trail. In a few minutes, you're beside another cliff face. In many places, the trail is little more than a narrow shelf carved into the rock. There are a number of waterfalls on the trail, but even in this remote location, parasites may be present so water must be filtered before drinking. The glacier is now only about a mile away, and there's a small clearing. If this were midsummer, it would be filled with blooming bear grass. After the clearing, it gets steeper. It's a single track, wide enough for only one to pass at a time. Then there's an outcrop that provides one of the best views in the park. At one point, it's so steep that stairs are cut into the rock. Soon, you can hear the waterfall at the end of the valley, and there's another incredible view. Depending on your speed, you've been on the trail for two to three hours by this point and you've climbed about 1,200 feet, so you need to be reasonably fit. Or an eight-year-old boy accompanied by his rightfully very proud father. Grinnell Glacier is one of the most studied in the park. This lot is a U.S. Geological Survey team. At times, the trail can be quite narrow. Walking it may look perilous on camera, but it's not. Soon, you can hear the waterfall. Eventually, this meltwater will flow all the way to the Arctic Ocean. The trail was built in the early 1900s, but the first explorers bushwhacked their way up here in the 1850s. Back then, the ice extended all the way to the fall. Turn around to see where you've come, and you'll see the U-shaped signature of a glacier-carved valley and a string of aquamarine lakes. The boat dock where we started is at the near end of the second lake. Bears like this part of the trail because it's lined with berries. Ripe thimbleberries actually taste pretty good. 
Just before the rest area is the best view of the formation called the Angel's Wing. It looks like half the mountain was sheared off, and it was, by a glacier that once filled this valley. The rest area is a large open area with benches and a pit toilet. It's about 0.3 to 0.4 tenths of a mile from the top of the trail. The hardest part of the hike is still to come, so this is a good place to stop, rest, have lunch, and maybe add a layer of clothing. Bighorn sheep frequently graze in the nearby meadow. This video was shot on a different day. If you're lucky enough to see a bighorn, remember that they are wild and unpredictable. The hike up the moraine to the Grinnell Glacier Overlook is steep. It rises almost 400 feet, and for many, it's the most strenuous part of the trail. When you're at the top, four miles from the boat dock, you may be tired, but the views are well worth the effort. If you're lucky, you may see a bighorn sheep up here, too. Few continue to the glacier. Most just rest here and take in the amazing scenery. The glacier itself is still about a half mile away. Some even cool their feet in the very cold water. There's much to take in. The rock face is 3,000 feet high. The waterfall, nearly 1,000. Like Lower Grinnell Lake, the water here gets its striking color from glacial flower scraped off by the glacier. Most of those who make it up here know that the glacier is shrinking, and they want to see it before it's gone. This film crew is from Japanese television. As glaciers die, crevasses form near the edge, or foot of the glacier. Ice then breaks off and becomes a berg. Bergs now cover much of the upper Grinnell Lake. Over time, some of the bergs turn on their side, revealing ice layers that are hundreds of years old. Layers are also visible on the wall of the arete. They were laid down over a billion years ago. This is Salamander Glacier. In the early 1900s, it was connected to Grinnell Glacier. Today, the two glaciers are separated by hundreds of feet of rock. To get to the glacier, you'll have to cross a stream. I've seen just how fast the ice is melting. When I was here in 1995, the glacier was about 500 feet longer than it is today. Back then, there were still small ice caves, and the rangers were giving tours on the ice. The ice is now thin and flat. In fact, it's far too thin to walk on safely. Glacier melt isn't always bad news. In the 1930s, ice covered this spot. When it melted, it revealed 1.4 billion, that's with a B, year-old fossils of what was once the Earth's dominant species. These are stromatolite fossils. These humble algae colonies are responsible for giving the Earth its breathable oxygen. Before them, the atmosphere was carbon dioxide, but their waste gas was oxygen. They were formed in warm, shallow seas, proof that this ice-covered mountaintop was once a tropical shoreline. By now, you might be wondering what sort of effort is required to reach this spot. So I asked hiker Tim Curry about his thoughts. And uh, that last four-tenths of a mile uh, was a little steeper than I, uh, uh, I expected. So was the effort worth the view? It was absolutely worth it. Uh, I would recommend this to anybody who's uh, of sound limb, but I wouldn't recommend it to anybody who was not quite in shape for the mountain because you do feel the altitude. It is a steep climb. It's very rocky, and you should be in shape for it. And fitness clearly is not based on age. This grandma did it, and she's... 77. And she didn't take the boat. She started from the trailhead, five and a half miles away. It took her four hours to get here. And what did she think of it? Ah, oh, it's marvelous. The Grinnell Glacier Trail is one of the most scenic in North America, and one of the few that follows a glacial valley past stunning vistas with an incredible lake, and then ends at a remnant of the last ice age. This is more than a beautiful place. It's also a great place to learn something about geology, the earliest forms of life, and climate change. So when you're in Glacier National Park, if you do only one hike, the Grinnell Glacier Trail is the one to do. This segment describes the hike to the Tarbigan Tunnel from the Many Glacier area. The first two and a half miles rises just about 700 feet until the Tarbigan Falls. From there, the trail climbs another 1,000 feet in a mile and a half to Tarbigan Lake. The final push is a 600-foot, one-mile climb to the tunnel and the amazing view on the other side. The trail is shared by the Iceberg Lake Trail, and the trailhead is located behind the Swift Current Motor and Parking Lot 
at about 5,300 feet. The footage from here to the falls was taken the day I hiked to Iceberg Lake as I used a better camera. The steady climb is mostly out of the trees with nice views of the surrounding mountains. The area is frequented by bears, so make noise and practice other bear safety precautions. The temperature was in the 40s and the sky was threatening on this early September day. One of my favorite things about hiking in Glacier is the tree line is pretty low and you're often hiking above it. So here you get to see the mountains, not just a bunch of trees. The trail does go through a few groves and in one of them there was some bear scat. If you haven't seen bear scat before, you need to know what it looks like. Big pile of bear scat. This pile is a bit old, so hopefully the bear left the area. This was the first day the trail had been open in weeks because of bear activity. It was closed the next day for the same reason. And if you see bear scat, be alert. These folks were heading to the Iceberg Lake, but now they're retreating because a mama bear and two of her cubs were using the trail. I got this footage from a hiker who got out of the way and shot some phone footage of the bear family. This footage was responsible for closing the trail the next day. Bear activity frequently closes this trail, so if it's open, do it, because it might be closed tomorrow. The bears were seen heading safely into the woods, so the group turned around again and headed back to Iceberg. The first leg of the trail ends at Tarbigan Falls, and here they are. In the case you're wondering how long it took a 50-year-old man to get there. Carbrigan Falls it took an hour and two minutes or so to get here. That race well, the two. falls are nice, but not spectacular, especially when the water is this low. But it's a good place to have a snack and rest before the steepest part of the trail. Not far from the bridge, there's a side trail with a signpost pointing to the Tarbigan Tunnel. The Tarbigan Trail you, goes to you? the right okay. and up the slope. And I knew this was going to be a tough hike. It's 2,300 feet up from the trailhead. So on this leg of the journey, I decided to take the lightest camera I owned at the time. It wasn't a very good camera, so I shot some stills, too. The weather kept changing, and while there were clearings, much of the trail is in dense forest, which makes it easier to surprise a bear. And after about an hour or so, I was well above treeline and in a cirque. There was also a hole next to the trail, which was recently dug. You know, probably by a bear. Here's some of the bad video of the Cirque and Ptarmigan Lake. Miles away. It was drizzling and getting colder. And one reason I'm showing you this shot is just to point out how quickly cameras have gotten better. The camera used here isn't that old, but it uses an obsolete technology called videotape. Today, cell phones have much better cameras. And the switchbacks may look like they're cut into a sheer cliff wall, but they weren't too bad. It took only 20 minutes to climb the remaining 600 vertical feet to the tunnel. Here are my first impressions. Okay, two hours, 49, 48 minutes. Heart rate 119, it was much, it was 140, so I'm coming up this hill. Last bit of 600 feet of up. There's switchbacks in the trails. Not fun. Started out five and a half, 5.2 miles that way. Started raining bottom of the lake or well, halfway up the lake there's the tunnel it's cold it's raining it's cold it's raining I'm here tired but the view's not bad you know it's not bad I'm not sure it's worth all this effort but I've finally been here and I've done it my disappointment wouldn't last for long this is the tunnel it's only about 60 feet long and the day before, it was occupied by a bear who was using it as a shelter. But this is the view from the other side. It definitely made this trip worth all the effort. The rapidly changing weather was a bit unnerving, but it made for very dramatic and impressive images. To the right you see red rock that was laid down in a shallow sea millions of years ago, and that's Elizabeth Lake in the valley. There were a few other hikers up there, and we discussed the situation. While I was talking to one of them, I looked down, straight down. Then I quickly snapped several pictures, and it's a good thing I did, because a few minutes later, the clouds had moved in, and visibility dropped to near zero. It was time to start thinking about getting back down safely. I took in the view for a while, 
but once the view had gone, there was no reason to stay. It was time to start thinking about heading down. They said a cold front was coming through, and I think it was coming through till tomorrow. On the other side, the clouds were even more dramatic. They were just rolling over the 8,000-foot divide. And by the way, I was so captivated by the weather that once again, I forgot to take a shot inside the tunnel. And when you're out here, you're pretty much on your own. There are no reliable weather forecasts here. And the mountains tend to make up their own weather anyway. And remember, there's no cell phone coverage. So you can't call somebody or look at a radar app on your phone. It's an interesting predicament. There are over five miles and 2,300 feet of potentially slippery slope to go. And the trail goes through lightning attracting, tree lined bear country. It's impossible to know whether it's better to wait or to go. So I just enjoy the uniqueness of the experience. <laughs> it really was quite amazing. Then I had a snack and was about to head down. It's sleeting pretty good. Cold fronts come through. When it started to sleet. Oh, people just came down. If it continued, it would be a rather slippery descent. So once again, I had to decide, do I stay or do I go? Well, I decided to go. 45 minutes later, I was 1,300 feet lower. It was raining, and this is what I had to say. It's 36 degrees, I'm fogging up. About a thousand more feet to down to go, about three miles or so, maybe two. It's pretty cool, but now it was kind of scary before. And after the rain came the fog. The video camera kept fogging up, so I switched to the still camera again. Sometimes this hindered the view. At other times, it made it interesting. And when I got below the fog, the clouds got really interesting. I've hiked hundreds of miles in this park, and this hike was one of the most memorable. The cold, rain, sleet, and fog made it special. And I also captured one of my favorite images. I've shot thousands of images here since 1994. And in the few minutes that the valley and hill and lake was visible, I was able to stitch together one of my favorite shots. So let's do a quick recap on the Tarbingen Trail hike. It is one of my favorites. And the trailhead is just behind the Swift Current Motor Inn. It starts out in the open, and it's pretty easy. Then it gets quite hard on the way up. It is frequented by bears. It's often closed. So if you're here and the trail happens to be open, take it when you can. You never know when it's going to be closed, and later in the year, August, September, it's much more likely that that will happen.